night, the bishop and the sister fall asleep, and his sister fall asleep, and uh, Valjean rises from his bed. And he rummages through the house and creeps off into the darkness with all of the family and church silver. The next morning, there are three policemen who arrive at the bishop's house. They knock on his door, and Valjean is, in, is with them. They've caught him with the stolen silver, and they're ready to send him back to prison for life. The bishop responds to the accusation the policeman makes against this man in a way that no one expects. So you are here, Valjean, he exclaimed. I'm delighted to see you. Had you forgotten that I'd given you the candlestick as well? They're silver, just like the rest of the uh, 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 products he's taken. They're worth a good uh, 200 francs. Valjean did you forget to take them? Valjean is rather startled. He's taken aback and he stares at this old priest with uh, an expression that no words can convey. Valjean is no thief, the bishop explains to the policeman. This silver is my gift to him. When the policemen leave, go their way, the bishop gives his candlesticks to the, his new guest, who is now standing in front of the bishop, speechless, trembling. And the bishop says to him these words, Valjean, do not forget, do not ever forget that you have promised to use money to make yourself an honest man. Well, you know the story. And the power of the bishop's act, defying every human instinct for revenge, changes Valjean's life forever. And it's an, it's an encounter with forgiveness. It's an encounter with no judgment on the person at all. And this encounter with forgiveness has melted the granite defences of Valjean's soul. He always kept hold of those candlesticks for the rest of his life as a, as a precious memento of the grace that he had received. And he dedicates himself from this point on to help others in need. Now, brothers and sisters, this story written long ago by Victor Hugo is a great illustration, I think, of the process that Paul believes that uh, this fellow brother in Christ, Philemon, will follow in regard to his runaway slave, Onesimus. Paul is here mediating between these two believers. And just like Jesus did, Paul, pla uh, Paul places a very high premium on a face-to-face -face reconciliation. And so he sends Onesimus back to Philemon for this issue of uh, Onesimus' act of theft to be resolved. Onesimus has wronged Philemon, his boss, his owner, in his own home. He's a runaway slave. He's a thief. But he's been changed by Jesus. And now he's willing to return to make amends whatever that cost is to himself. And Paul here in this letter to Philemon is, willing, is, is uh, confident 
that Philemon will do the right thing by Onesimus in just the same way that the bishop treated Jean Valjean. Philemon will see Onesimus as a changed man, as a brother in Christ. Philemon will care for his slave's spiritual needs. And so as we come to the close of this letter, there are three instructions that Paul gives uh, to Philemon. And I think that they're, well, I don't think, I know, they are instructions still for us here this morning. Look at verse 17. And here Paul instructs Philemon to accept the person. Accept the person. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. This verse, I think, is the letter's central point. You can imagine, if you can put your, uh, uh, get your imaginations going, that uh, the day comes and Onesimus arrives at Philemon's door. I wonder how Onesimus felt to go back to a home where uh, he had been treated well, but in a criminal act he had thieved, uh, 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 stolen from his boss. How am I going to be received? What's he going to say? I mean, he could punish me rather severely. Will I be greeted in the same way at this door in this home just as Paul has expressed to me that he hoped Philemon would. And what about Philemon? With the wrongs that have been committed against him, this trusted servant who had betrayed that trust, now he stands in front of me for Philemon, even Maybe if he was the most forgiving of Christian masters, would he not find it difficult to be just a little bit angry when he opens the door and finds this runaway slave standing there? If you consider me a partner, Paul writes, welcome him as you would welcome me. The word that Paul uses here for welcome is more than just, uh, 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 hi there, Onesimus, great to see you. Come on in. The word for welcome here that Paul uses actually has a meaning inherent in the word that it requires of Philemon to go beyond a mere welcome. The word literally means to take to oneself. And that has a slightly do, uh, different ring to it than kind of just greeting someone at the front door with a shake of the hand and, hey, come on in. Welcoming somebody. We do it so easily. It can be often just a matter of duty, a matter of protocol. But here Paul is asking a Philemon, Brother, when Onesimus stands at your front door, I want you to embrace him. I want you to welcome Onesimus as a gift from the heart. It's a bit like if somebody comes to you and gives you a gift. Maybe, let's say, a, 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 a a wonderful painting of some sort. And so you take this painting and it's like when you receive that painting, it's like the, the, the one who is taking it is going to put it in an honoured place in their home. And this is the, the inference of what Paul is asking Philemon to do here. Restore Onesimus to fellowship. Give him access to your heart. 
embrace him without prejudice. Brothers and sisters, it's often difficult, isn't it, to to accept those kinds of people who are different to us. It seems to me that uh, when sin entered the world and entered my life and entered our lives together in the communities in which we live, that the lines of discrimination uh, seem to be woven into the very fabric of our lives. Every society is characterised in part by those people who are acceptable and those who are not. Can you remember the uh, days when you were at school? And uh, maybe some of you are sporty and enjoy sports. Uh, Maybe there are some of you who have no interest in sport at all. But you remember those days, physical education uh, period would come around and uh, the uh, phys ed teacher lines you up in two lines or, 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 or calls out two pe- members as a captain. And their job is to select their teams. You know what it's like? Yeah, I'll take you. And I'll take you. No, I'll bypass you. I'll take you. No, I don't want you. No, 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 you're too soft. No, I'll take you. You know the story. And we end up in our society excluding people out of pride, out of fear, or maybe even out of a desire to feel superior. Discrimination. The greatest place where I've seen discrimination uh, to a degree and I haven't been able to do this for two, a couple of years now because of lockdowns, but I used to uh, travel uh, quite regularly uh, in my position as Australian Director of MECO and uh, go to the Middle East. And uh, it, it always, it, you, your heckles rile a little bit um, when you enter a plane and they take you through the first class session, section and then the business class section, and you're kind of in cattle class at the back of the plane. I always used to feel that because I have got fairly long legs, and travelling cattle class for 18 hours to the Middle East, kind of, you're not the same when you get off the plane. But you, you know what it's like. We see it. So you go down and you sit in your cattle class seat at the back of the plane and then these first class passengers arrive. They're served with gourmet food. They have china and crystal and uh, proper plates to eat off. Those of us who are stuck at the back, well, we get our snacks served to us in cardboard boxes, plastic utensils, in the first class, if you have ever had the privilege to, to travel, I haven't, I must add, but there's room to stretch out. You can even go to sleep. Cattle class, you rest your chin on your knees as you're squashed in behind the seat in front and the worst thing is to have some little child who plays with the up and down button in the seat. Of, you, you, you know what I mean. And then have you observed that once the plane gets underway, a curtain is drawn. Kind of, it sends a message, doesn't it? We're separated now into two compartments. And that curtain is a reminder that there are some on this plane who are privileged. And there are some who are not and those who are not should probably learn to stay in their place. So there's this great act of exclusion. It divides the world into us and them, master and slave, the righteous and the unrighteous. 
And the great message of the gospel is this, that Jesus came to remove those walls. Jesus came as a great wall destroyer. In Jesus' death, he broke down the religious uh, barriers, the temple barriers. He dismantled the walls of hostility. He separated, uh, that had separated those categories of people since the beginning of time. And so the gospel does a a, a marvellous thing. It brings people who were once separated together. And this is what Paul says when he writes to the church at Rome. We are to accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. What a miracle that is. It doesn't happen in many other places, but it should happen regularly and be a hallmark of God's people when they meet in a place like this. We are to accept whom God accepts. We are to see that person through Jesus' eyes. And God receives into his family those men and women and young people who've been formerly scarred by their sin. He unites us all. Uh, he unites us all into himself through the grace of the gospel. And brothers and sisters, we've sung about that this morning, haven't we? God's amazing grace. Grace and love divine. We need to remember again and again and again that it is through grace that the derelict slave can become a citizen of the kingdom. There's a tax collector. His name is Zacchaeus and he can be redeemed and called a son of Abraham. There is a terrorist. His name is Saul and he becomes a chosen instrument to take the good news to the Gentiles. This is what a privileged slave owner can learn. That Christian charity, Christian love, Christian grace extends to all people, including the slave. And so for Philemon to accept Onesimus, Paul is challenging him here. Philemon, you must extend the same grace that you receive from God and extend it to your brother Onesimus. It doesn't mean that Philemon has to overlook the wrong that has done against, been done against him. God never calls us to a blind tolerance. But the wrong must be dealt with. And it's dealt with through forgiveness. So, Paul's first instruction to Philemon is this, accept the person. And then note his second instruction, verses 18 to 20. Philemon, forgive the wrong. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I might have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Paul is using here an ancient rhetorical strategy. He's he's challenging Philemon. He's, He's reminding Philemon from the depths that he himself has come from. Paul mentions this. Can I mention to you that you owe me your very self? Now, I don't believe that Paul is trying to be manipulative here. Paul is simply reminding Philemon of the basis that their relationship is founded on. He's saying in this letter to Philemon, Hey, Philemon, you're my brother in Christ. We are brothers in Christ. Philemon, don't forget where you came from. Just like Onesimus. 
Philemon was brought to faith through Paul's ministry. And so Paul here very suddenly and very skillfully converts Philemon from being a creditor whose debt will be repaid in full to a debtor. He owes Paul as a spiritual father something and Paul reminds him there is nothing he can do to ever repay the grace and the love that he has received through, from Christ through the ministry of Paul. Brothers and sisters, this is another challenge for us, is I think. When it comes to forgiveness, we find it difficult. When it comes to forgiveness, and we probably agree, that forgiveness is a very wonderful idea until we have to practice it. It's interesting in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus links our own need for forgiveness to our willingness to forgive others. It doesn't mean that God's forgiveness is dependent on our having forgiven others first. We should never expect to receive what we're unwilling to give. But we tend to shun forgiveness. We tend to cast it aside whenever it appears to be too costly, especially to us. You see, if Philemon receives Onesimus into his home again, it might cost him his reputation in the community. How how would Philemon look to his neighbours who are observing his, his household every day? Philemon's a weak man. He's a soft man. If Philemon is going to welcome this slave back, he might well uh, welcome others back. Wow, that, 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 that's a huge threat to, to our, our system of slavery that depends on fear and punishment to be able to run smoothly. Forgiveness, you see, crosses or offering this forgiveness to Onesimus would would cross the boundary of everything that the Roman society accepted as normal. But brothers and sisters, the reality is this, that forgiveness is the only way to break the cycle of oppression. And by forgiving Onesimus, Philemon would be a partner with God in God's work of saving sinners. You know as well as I do that forgiving others is really, really hard work. It doesn't come naturally to us. It's so easy to harbour the wrongs that have been done to us. The difficulty with that is that in the end, our hearts become hard. And if we're not careful they also become bitter. Forgiving men and women who have wounded us is not simply like flipping a a light switch on and off. It's tough. The Oxford University professor C.S. Lewis put it like this. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has excused the inexcusable in you. So will Philemon remember that he too is a debtor? He's bankrupt. But he too has been forgiven by God. Will he accept Onesimus as his brother? Will he accept the fact that God has forgiven Onesimus? And will he accept Onesimus back 
as a brother. These are the choices that Paul lays before Philemon. Brothers and sisters, they're the same choices that God lays before us. Some of you will have heard, I think, the remarkable story of that Dutch lady, Corrie ten Boom. Corrie was uh, taken away by, in the Second World War by the Nazi, uh, German Nazis and uh, taken to Ravensbrück uh, concentration camp. And there she watched in horror as these Nazi German soldiers and jailers brutalised her sister, Betsy. Uh, through the processing centre there at Ravensbrook. And many years later, the rest of her family were killed in, in those concentration camps. Corrie miraculously was able to be freed and lived. And many years later, the war had ended and she was a guest speaker at a uh, meeting in Munich. And at the end of the meeting, one of those jailers approached her. She just finished delivering her message in a church service. And she writes this. He was the first of our jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men the heaps of clothing, Betsy's plain blanched face, and his hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. And even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man and I was going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I couldn't. I felt nothing. Not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. So again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him, while into my heart sprang a love for the stranger that almost overwhelmed me. So I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. Brothers and sisters, when we are called to forgive those who have wounded us, those who have hurt us, those who have inflicted pain upon our lives, we need to yield those injuries into Christ's care. It's interesting, isn't it? Have you noticed when the last three weeks when this passage has been read to us, Paul never once mentions the word forgiveness. But he encourages Philemon to do it. Then finally, folks, as we close this letter this morning, verses 21 to 22. Philemon, accept the person. Philemon, offer forgiveness to your brother. And then thirdly, Philemon, bestow a blessing bestow a blessing. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing you that you will do even more than I ask. 
Oh, and w- one other thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayer. Maybe this last thing is the most difficult thing for Philemon to do. To bestow a blessing upon Onesimus. This is the grand finale, we might say. This would be a sure sign of the work of forgiveness that has been done in Philemon's life. Brothers and sisters, isn't it true that when we've been wounded, when we've been hurt, when others have inflicted pain upon us, most often the cry of our heart is this, why should I? Why should I? Why should I give my time, my energy, why should I even give any attention to someone who's offended me? Why should I share my life with someone who has shown no respect for it? I might be willing to forgive, (coughs) but to give, to bestow on this person a blessing on top of all that I've already done? Wow. That could be too hard. I suspect... (coughs) knowing what life is like, (coughs) that there are people in this auditorium this morning who can probably identify with that kind of sentiment. You've been burnt. But the reality, brothers and sisters, is this, that if we truly desire to have a restored relationship with a brother or sister, we need to be willing to take the initiative. We need to give to that person or those people loving actions that communicate in unmistakable ways the reality and sincerity of our forgiveness offered to them and make a commitment as much as we are able to reconcile ourselves with them. The letter closes. And to some degree, we're a little unsure of what the end result was. We can only guess. What did happen when Onesimus knocked on the door of Philemon's house? We can hear Paul's confidence that Philemon will free Onesimus because of his devotion to God's calling. And since this letter has been included in, the, in our scriptural canon, we have every reason to assume that Philemon did just what Paul asked him to do. Based on the historical evidence that we have, there are many who believe that Philemon Return, received Onesimus and then sent Onesimus back to Paul in Rome where he could be a helper to the Apostle. In other words, it seems that maybe Onesimus matured into a great man of God. Fifty years after this letter was written, there was the Christian martyr Ignatius, Bishop Ignatius. He'd been captured by the Romans he was being transported back to Rome to be, to be executed. And he wrote a number of letters to different churches around Asia at that time. He wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus. And in it, very interestingly, Ignatius praises a certain bishop named Onesimus who had visited him. So if the history is right, it appears likely that Onesimus, this runaway slave, ultimately became the bishop of the church at Ephesus. 
that fact may be mere coincidence. Nevertheless, I'm convinced of the power of forgiveness because it can set free and restore the lives just as it did Onesimus and Philemon. I'll close with this. During the First World War, a German soldier was on the front line opposing the British. And in the middle of a uh, of uh, shooting going backwards and forwards, a German soldier dived into an out-of-the-way foxhole. And there he found a wounded enemy. There lying before him was a fallen British soldier and he was soaked in blood. He only had a few minutes to live. The German looked at this man and he was touched. He realised this, this soldier is dying. And so the German reached around and got his water bottle and offered the soldier some water. And through this small kindness, a bond began to be formed. The dying soldier pointed to his pocket and the German soldier leaned forward and took out the man's wallet and there he found some pictures of the dying man's family. He held them up so the wounded soldier could look at them. He could see his family for the last time. And with bullets raging over them and war going on all around them, these two enemies, just for a moment, were friends. What happened in that shell hole? Did all war cease to exist? Not at all. Were all the wrongs made right? No, no, no. no. What happened was this, that two enemies saw each other as people in need of help. Brothers and sisters, that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness begins by rising above the war. It looks beyond the uniforms that people are wearing. It's choosing to see each other not as foe, but as friend. And desiring that our fellow soldier will make it home safely. What about you this morning? Is there a wounded soldier in your life? Is there someone in your life that God is calling you to care for? Then go. As Jesus said, be reconciled. Forgive one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Let's pray. Father, we've sung with our lips this morning about your love and your grace. Father, we, we just don't have human words <coughs> enough to express the debt that we owe you. The love which has seen your Son sent from heaven to endure suffering, to die upon a cross so that our sins might be forgiven. And that more than just forgiveness being offered to us, 
you grant to us new life, freedom. Father, you, you know our hearts. And you know all the experiences of life that we have been through. Good days, difficult days. You know also the people that we've encountered along the way. And there have been those people in our lives like Paul, Philemon, who have encouraged us, strengthened us, carried us in the Spirit of Christ. But Father, too, you know those people who have come and entered our experience of life and damaged us, hurt us. Father, by your Holy Spirit, Give us the courage and the strength where we have not yet done it to forgive, to be reconciled. Father, it's a tough thing. It's a hard thing. But like Corey did long ago, we call upon you to help us. Father, as we go from this place this morning, may we go with a new sense of purpose, of courage, that we are your people, and as much as it is able on our part, we will endeavour to live at peace with all men and women. We pray this in Jesus' name.